So I just went over um, welcoming us into right relationships of place, honoring the Ohlone people, honoring the elements, inviting us to be related to everyone in this room, highlighted our landing page and our email, and our aspirations, which again are reflected in our landing page, are to get clarity on why right relationships, the right kinds of investments are critical for Mother Earth, for economies, for all beings. And to invite you to engage, including with investments in these. And then each of the panelists will be speaking about a particular topic. And so I want to um, talk in just a second about right relationships with how we want to engage with you in a, with a Mentimeter. But why don't you just say your name, your organization, and that's it. Hi, Jamie Gloche. I'm a co-founder of Native Women Lead and Managing Director of Impact Investments at Common Future. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Vanessa Roanhorse, uh, CEO of Roanhorse Consulting and a co-founder of Native Women Lead as well. And I'm Kali Akuno um, with Cooperation Jackson, but I'm also here representing the People's Network for Land and Liberation. And I'm Lawrence Ellis, representing One Thriving Planet founder and lead sustainability um, advisor with A Plan Coaching. And so, again, more information about us is on the landing page. And um, the flow is really just going to follow what I said. We're going to do an opening. We're going to hear about our right relationships. We're going to then have each person speak for about four minutes. And we're going to invite you to engage with us. I'm going to say a bit more about the Mentimeter app we're using to engage with us. Then the next person will go, engage with us. The next person will go, engage with us. Next. Then we'll do a call to action, and each of us. And then we're going to just open it up for engagement. And then close in kind of respectful ritual ways. Any questions? Everybody in the right place? OK. All right. So if you could show the QR code, please, Anthony. OK, so can everybody get that QR code? Should be taking a picture of you all, taking a picture <laughs> of you all getting a QR code. So while you're getting <laughs> So what we want to do is really emphasize right relationships with you. We don't want this to be just talking heads. We have a set of questions in this app, the Mentimeter, and we want to find out what you're thinking, what excites you, what questions and concerns you have, you know, what will prompt you to dive in more, etc. And so that's what we're going to do as a way, again, of deepening our relationships with you so that we can address some of your questions, issues, concerns. And then again, at the end, we're going to open it up to more of an open discussion Q&A. Right? So I want to hand it over to Vanessa and Kali to talk about our right relationships. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, hi, everybody. We're so happy to be here. Um, so the panel's called Right Relationships. Uh, we Let me just start by telling a story. Um, back in like May, April, May, we all submitted our proposals to SOCAP. I submitted one for the Matriating Economies Apprenticeship. Lawrence submitted one, Kali submitted one. Um, and then around August, I believe, maybe late July, we got an, an email telling us, hey, welcome to SOCAP. You will be a speaker. Awesome. However, we're doing this thing called councils. Um, and what we're going to do is you're going to work with these other groups that you've never met, that you don't know, and you're going to come up with a theme. And we think collectively you guys are all talking about rematriation, question um, <laughs> mark. And it was sort of like, wait, what? Like, whoop, whoop. Um, and then it was like, so you're saying we are now working with a group of folks that I don't know and I've never met. And I don't know their body of work. And they like, we believe you guys can actually come up with something pretty special. I mean, I know we can. We are experts at what we do. We are excellent at where we're coming from. But the question was like, 
But how do we create something meaningful when what we're talking about is so diverse, where we come from is so different, how we're approaching these solutions are uniquely to what we're building. And so began a journey, <laughs> a very tough journey, where we actually had to explore the concept of right relationships for ourselves. And that journey took a lot of twists and a lot of turns. There was a lot of investigations and I'm trying to understand why SOCAP went this way. Why would they ask individual leaders and experts in our fields to just come together and create a panel under rematriation? So we came up with, well, let's talk about right relationship. Because to be fully in transparency with everybody, we know how hard these spaces are. And two, we didn't know each other from Adam or Eve or the creator. And so we actually had to find right relationship with each other. And through this journey, we actually lost one of our speakers because it was too hard. This was just taxing, took too much time. And frankly, when we talk about right relationship, this is literally what it looks like, is commitment, ability to show up, and then when you can't, raising your hand and say, I can't do this anymore. And that is respect for our other speaker who took herself out of the equation. So with that, I just wanted to start there and hand it to Kali to finish out why we're all here. Well, let me start with my particular part in this journey, which is almost being the second speaker to bow. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the proposal that I was a part of was part of a coalition. Uh, roughly four different groups trying to get our act together to talk about our common program and then come on. And the person who was really coordinating that um, was a white guy, a good friend of mine, but someone who volunteered to do some work knowing, rec you know, recognizing that he was kind of out of position to, to be the speaker on this, uh, but was just trying to create space and room for myself and, and some of the other folks uh, to do, to come and like make a presentation, knowing that at least for two of our organizations, the summertime is a big breadwinner for us. So, you know, we were like, thank you for helping. But then <laughs> there was a string of like emails and calls and I was just, I remember calling him like, look, this is too much. I just want to show up, um, represent the organ, you know, represent the coalition, um, and get back to the to the dirty work. And if someone is interested in in joining us and partnering with us, we'll be happy to talk to them. But it wasn't really until, and I appreciate this, it wasn't really until, you know, uh, some of the folks on this panel here really just reached out to me and with like a call in to be like, hey, what's going on? You know, we're we're struggling to make this happen. Uh, we would like for you to join. We, there's been that much communication. Then I had to pause and realize as, as off as I thought the process was of pulling us together, I was overlooking the actual human beings that I was going to be sharing with. And I needed to stop from like being mad at the process and then recognize that there's some actual people who I would like to be in community with to work with. So let me reorient that. So if nothing else comes out of this, I was like at least... I would meet some new good people, right? And so that began the, the relationship of trying to establish a right relationship amongst us to be able to present something to, to you and to the rest of the world. Thank you all. I just wanna add one thing. Thankfully, within our relationships, Jamie was able to come in and back. So I just wanna say, this is the full panel now. Jamie just threw down, like, can you help? Yes, I'm there. <laughs> you know. So I really want to honor and thank you. So with that, we want to dive into um, hearing from each of us about right relationships, starting with Jamie. Ooh, this has been like a journey. <laughs> One, I'll just have to say when Vanessa, when Vanessa said, oh, no, somebody dropped out of her panel, I was like, well, I'll be there. I can hop in no problem <laughs> she had no idea what she was walking into <laughs> i shoot from hip all the time so that's fine but it's 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 rooted really in trust and trust in like what vanessa's doing what she's part of and just being fully all in and trusting taking that leap of faith with my colleague here um 
for me, right relationship is really around not only building that trust, but being in full transparency, um, and especially with our folks and our, our community that we serve, ensuring that we're mitigating trauma, especially in investment, especially in work and capital, um, especially as we come from communities that have been um, not in right relationship with federal government or colonization, um, but really seek that right relationship in like connecting to Mother Earth and ensuring that people are not exploited and that um, we're in reciprocity. So for me, right relationship is about reciprocity and honoring people for the work that they do, but also the wisdom that they give for their time, their energy, their effort, their offerings, their gifts, knowing that we all are giving in very different ways, um, but ensuring that people are also receiving as well. And um, we've really tried to work through the investment journey. Do you want me to talk about that? OK, yeah. So we've been, for the past six years, developing an organization called Native Women Lead that serves indigenous women entrepreneurs and leaders. Started with eight indigenous women just trying to close our own racial wealth gaps through, hey, like a lot of us are entrepreneurs and leaders in the community. Why don't we create a network, a support system to support one another. And then that grew into a bigger idea of like, actually there's no one else doing this nationally supporting indigenous women, so let's do this together. And then learned a lot, highly invisible, making 50 to 60 cents to the dollar. Um, Two thirds of us are the primary breadwinners. One in three of us will experience violence in our lifetime. So, and the, I always throw this out now, the the, value of US land today is 23 trillion. I'm now sitting more on the reparation side of work in that that's actually owed. So in our offering, I, I come from a CDFI background. We wanted to ensure that capital was part of the conversation in the organization that we are building, primarily because we know that access to capital is a huge gap in our communities. And we learned that nearly Two thirds of our entrepreneurs needed funding at least 50,000 or more. 70% uh, of indigenous women were uh, essentially bootstrapping, funding their own businesses. And uh, less than 1% of money from philanthropy, investment, and SBA goes to indigenous women. So we're like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, there's a huge capital gap, right? Um, but in the past couple of years, we've also learned about how trauma whether intergenerational, relationship, systemic, structural, and um, personal, all of that, historical, how trauma actually has significant impact on people's brains, especially when they're in trauma response. They go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn. But it actually has a number of a number of impact in how people make financial decisions and how it shows up in financial behavior. So you see this in like courting. Um, warehousing of wealth, the billionaires that are out there that are, you know, doing that to the planet um, and people. So there's all these like interesting behaviors that come about it. And for us, really thinking about how we're serving our community with un this understanding of how trauma affects our community, but then how it actually affects behaviors. But then seeing that also in the ecosystem of how that infects, infects, uh, infects, whoa. Is that a slip or? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> affects, okay. Affects philanthropy, investment, and um, people, those in decision making and power, and how they make decisions on who is deserving of wealth, who is deserving of capital, and how that also affects our minds when we're in survival or scarcity mode and thinking that there's not enough. Um, and what would it look like to envision a future where we're in abundance and that there is enough and that we are deserving? So that's been our journey. We started a, to launch, we did three funds, relationship-based lending, lending, okay. And looking to build out a, a gender lens fund, but more so with the five R's of rematriation, which is an introduction to essentially how to do investment and lending in a very different way, not using the five C's of credit, which is highly ex exclusionary for many people. So I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> 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 I heard that. <laughs> I heard that. So um, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go to Mentimeter and uh, yeah. I think I'm... Oh. Yeah,
start. Okay. So please put into the Mentimeter, what did you hear? So what did you hear and what Jamie just shared? Put in a word, a phrase, sentence, you can put in a few. Clarity, trust, reparation, truth, we are owed, power. Take another 30 seconds, truth telling. Okay, try reloading. Okay. So the position of the words doesn't so much matter, it's the size. So what's really standing out is people heard power. They heard healing, they heard trust, they heard truth, they all a lot of other things. Empower intergenerational trauma, trauma incident effects, relationships, justice, empowering indigenous people, scarcity versus abundance, etc. So really wonderful, the five R's, really wonderful that Hear what you heard, let's go to the next question, which is, what excites you from what Jamie shared? Abundance. Yes. Matriarchy. Yes. This is so cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Live feedback. In what real she's time. doing excites people. <laughs> Let's take another 30 seconds. Okay, and for those, if anyone can't um, get it working, just shout out one or two words. Is there anyone who's not on Mentimeter? Okay, all right. All right, so let's take a look at this. Big standouts are closing the gap, abundance, opportunity, restoration, and a lot of other words. Let's go to the next one. What questions or concerns do you have about what Jamie shared? How do we distribute white backlash? Moving past the ego, burnout, mind shift, burnout. <laughs> We're like, burn out. <laughs> <laughs> How can we amplify who's with you? How can I co-create access to spaces? How do we move folks? Understanding on, on obstacles? How do you work on trauma? Yeah. Another 30, 10 seconds. Okay, let's go to the last one. What do you need to dive in, to dive in and engage with Jamie and her organization, to get engaged, to invest, to be a collaborator, whatever? What do you need to dive in? Connection, actionable examples, mentorship, a relationship, Understanding, information, invitation, a chance, contact info, directions, product. A meeting. <laughs> yes, blank checks. I like that. <laughs> Who are all the spend downs over here? <laughs> You're in spend down. <laughs> All right, so um, thank, you thank you for sharing so much. I um, just want to give you a round of applause for your engagement with the station. And now Kali is going to use that, you know, weaving in what Jamie shared and also some of your responses. So, Brother Kali. Yeah, thank you all um, for this. Um, you know, and I, I was wondering how this thing was going to work. Um, and excited, yeah, trust, and, and was excited to see it. Um, and what I had in mind was um, uh, I started thinking of my uh, father in particular, who is a, a jazz musician. And sure enough, that is what y'all have created or what we've created together. Um, so I'll have to remember this tool for that. Um, 
but building on on that, um, you know, you have a script, and then something like this makes you change. So I'm going to try to incorporate some elements just of of uh, our experience uh, into your feedback. But let me start by uh, trying to identify for all of you who and what I'm representing. So. Uh, there's my own organization, which is Cooperation Jackson, which is based in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and Jackson, Mississippi happens to be one of the blackest uh, cities uh, in the United States. It's roughly about 160 million, 100, I wish it was that many people, 100, <laughs> 160,000 people, uh, over 80% of whom are black. Uh, the vast majority of which are uh, working class and a good substantial portion, roughly about 50 cents, are at or below the poverty line. Uh, the other organizations that I'm representing here are Community Movement Builders, which is primarily based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and it's working primarily to do uh, social justice and economic empowerment in black communities. And many of you all might know it for being one of the lead uh, organizations um, struggling against this, this crazy cop city uh, piece that's being kind of imposed, but also being spread to cities throughout uh, the country. The latest version of that I hear is being uh, developed right here in, in Northern California over in the Bay Area, I think. I mean, the East, East Bay. Um, uh, and their work. Um, then there's Insight Focus, uh, which is a, a started as a black-led uh, tech organization, actually, uh, based out of Detroit, but is operating in Detroit, uh, but now also in uh, a small historic uh, black town called Idlewild. Um, and then there's Cooperation Vermont, which is a project um, that Cooperation Jackson and now many others have helped to uh, incubate per an invitation from some communities up there uh, to set up kind of a climate refuge, if you would, for black and brown folks, right? So that is uh, what I am representing here. And all of these two varying degrees were inspired by a little plan that we put out about a decade and a half ago uh, called the Jackson Cush Plan, which was trying to take um, a strategic read of our community uh, in all dimensions um, and build first and foremost power, but to be able to leverage the power of our, the strength of our numbers uh, into economic power, which we felt had been fleeting. Uh, and uh, we were trying to learn fundamentally from some of the lessons uh, that myself and many others in Jackson had learned from fighting against the federal government around black land lost, right? Particularly black farmers and the USDA and trying to bring forth many of those lessons to create more equity and control in our community. Um, and out of that, we've created basically a model which is centered on trying to create a community land trust to decommodify as much land in our communities as possible uh, build uh, cooperatives and other forms of, you know, worker self-organization for de democratizing the economy, uh, the local economies, and then really try to incorporate that with appropriate technology that we can control to kind of, you know, deal with the digital and what we call the, the uh, production divide so that we are ahead of the curve around some of these different things uh, and to put this all through a, a broad process of community direct community participation and engagement to, to transfer skills and to build wealth collectively. Uh, that is our experiment and what this network fundamentally is in part about. So we're gonna go again to the question to hear from you. What did you hear? Everything. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> well, lessons learned, replicable solutions, mm -hmm. collectivization. Collective wealth, collective power. 
Excellent. cooperation. Strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's go to the next question. What excites you about what he shared? <coughs> Everything. everything. <laughs> Who's putting everything? <laughs> That's great, everything. I want the everything button. <laughs> like the right. Best Idlewild. Regeneration. Mm -hmm. Engagement level. Efforts Kansas across City. states. Liberation. Self-determination. Power transfer. Deserve a potential. Like I like that one. Mm -hmm. Right, another 10 seconds. It can work. Mm -hmm. yeah, free to a land. movement. Okay. Let's go to the next one. What questions or concerns do you have for colleagues? First step, how can we help? As appropriate tech. How to scale you? Oh, my lord. Uh, <laughs> 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 Love it. Do you need allies? Biden opposition. Oh, yes, we need all allies. We have tons of opposition, uh, violent opposition, actually. Mm -hmm. We've already experienced that. Scalability. Yeah. Disenfranchisement. Yep. Seconds. Unawareness, yeah. Public policy. Light retrenchment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the last one. So what do you need to dive in, to engage with them? As a collaborator, as a funder, as an investor, what do you need to dive in? Oh, mm -hmm. Stories. Mm -hmm. Work plan. We all know what Clifton strengths you are now that I'm seeing work plan coming up. <laughs> I'm a, I know mean. who you are. I know. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> That's the work plan. <laughs> yes, work plan. Clarity and first steps. Expectation from Japan. I like that okay. one. Future vision. Mm -hmm. Seconds. What can corporations do? Mm -hmm. This is to elevate clarity on first steps. Future vision, yeah. How to protect and grow. Yeah, that is one we are trying to figure out. All right, again, thank you. Just a round of applause for you all. And um, Vanessa's going to go. I'm going to try not to be distracted. I'm going to be on a side setting something up for a second. But Vanessa's going to go. Awesome. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, hi, again, Vanessa Roanhorse. Um, today, you know, I really wanted to talk about the Retreating Economies Apprenticeship. Um, the, sh the, the quick story of how that came about is in 2019, I was at SOCAP, but we were at Fort Mason, uh, Jamie and I, and we were looking at Alcatraz. It was a very strange moment. And we had been sort of navigating the space um, and ran into somebody, an investor, and we were explaining our vision for Native Women Lead. We're explaining what it would look like to have unfettered capital moving to our women, to our network. And his quick response was, you know, quickly tell me why indigenous women are investable. Why should I care? And that stumped us. Well, it was, why should I care about indigenous women? That's right. Why should I care about indigenous women? Um, and that moment, first of all, Jamie and I are, are in this space, right? Uh, we come from very diverse backgrounds. Uh, we're talking to people who are on the side casually discussing millions and billions of dollars. 
uh, they're also saying, how can your thing have great impact? Amazing. How quickly can it scale? Uh, and it was like, we're talking about human beings. We're talking about farming cycles. We're talking about historical trauma. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> and so that was a moment. And we were both shook. We were shook to our core. And we came back and we decided two things. We were going to be at some point in our lives saying, you got 10, you got 10,000, you get 10,000, you get 10,000. That was one. That was a moment in the elevator. But the other was, we can't be the only ones here. This is exhausting. So uh, in 2019 at SOCAP, we kind of made a pinky swear to one another that whatever happens when we come back to SOCAP, we wouldn't come alone. So I'm happy to say in partnership with New Mexico Community Capital, Liz Gamboa, Native Women Lee, Jamie Gloche, myself at Run Horse Consulting, we came together, we applied for a $10 million grant uh, called the Equality Can't Wait, and we won. Thank you. We're taking an ecosystems approach, and one of the ecosystems approach was whatever we do, we better be leaving the ladder down, like Auntie Deb Holland tells us to do, for more indigenous women to move into positions of leadership, decision making, and ultimately the check writers, those folks sitting in these funds who finally get to decide where money gets to flow. And I'm happy to say this year we launched the first ever Rematriating Economies Apprenticeship. It's a five month uh, paid program supporting 10 indigenous women from all across the country. We have two of our apprentices here today, Holly Patterson and Mary Oxendine. And the plan here is we not only need to be raising our own funds, we also need to be sitting on the other side of the table making these choices and decisions, however, whatever it looks like. So as we finish out our apprenticeship, which they will graduate at the end of November, we'll have a beautiful celebration in December in New Mexico. By Q1, the intention is to place them into a venture equity fund. And if we're successful at placing all 10 women by the end of Q1 2024, we will have tripled the number of indigenous women in venture in the United States and Canada. So, Rhea, that's what we're doing. Oh, I have more time. I'm like, let's go. Um, so I guess the only thing I would add to that is like, we have to be moving the levers at all times, at all moments. Um, and so for this ecosystems approach, the rematriating economies is how we're opening this door open. Uh, we have him here at SOCAP. We'll see them where they're going to be placed next year. But I think what's most critical when we think about the stories that everyone here is talking about is burnout is real. Holding the line is hard. And ultimately, we need all of us sitting at all parts of the decision-making table to be able to support and invest in all of these so we do get collective power. So we can imagine a different economy, but most importantly, one that centers all living beings where we are decentered. Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vanessa. I remember we're recording. Thank you, Vanessa. You got it. <laughs> so again, what did you hear from Vanessa? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm all, yes, amazing. Um, triple, we've got ecosystem. Tenacity. Tenacity can't be the only one. Okay, now I'm We need to, to write checks, unfettered capital, unfettered. take your power. Badassness, I like that. I'll take it. I'll take badass. 10 million. 10 yes, million. 10 million. Native women matter. Big things happen. Generational power. Yep. Possibility, being a boss. Vision. Vision. Shift power. Triple, though. That's real. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Let's go to the next question. What excites you about what she shared? All of it. All of it. <laughs> Dream big. <laughs> Tenacity, uh, scale, the humans. Courage. Increasing Open access. Courage. Yeah, opening. Future, Future check, check writer. writer. <laughs> check writers. Um, 
Thank you for all of it. 10 million, women-centered. Support for Native women, showing it's possible, breaking barriers. Sisters Another. nodding here. Another 10 <laughs> seconds. Vision. We all have it. I can't read. All right. And the next question, what questions or concerns do you have for Vanessa and what she shared? Naysayers. Oh my God, don't even get me started. <laughs> Increase the cohort for sure. Yep. 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 Uh, VC matchmaking pro pipeline. Just for heads up, we don't use pipeline. We talk about it as from a waterway, but I know what you're saying. Increase the cohort. Uh, la -la. Can I add one thing for the burnout? Because I think we were really intentional when designing RIA. We also wanted to ensure that Indigenous women were protected in going into non-Indigenous spaces, especially mm -hmm. in finance. So we wove it with a trauma-informed approach. Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. How Thank to you. Mobilize allies. Oh. All right. Let's go to the last question. So, what do you need to dive in to fully engage, to become a collaborator, to become a funder, to become an investor? Any other way of engaging? Connection. Roadmap. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> we I'm say ready. Skoden. Skoden. Address for checks. I, I can't help with address right. for checks. I can tell you where to send those checks. <laughs> <laughs> What's my role? Yeah. Open arms. Concrete next steps. Oh, I've got, we, we've got it. Hearing more of what you need conversation with Asia. Yes, Asia, where are you? Mm -hmm. I want that. Corporate support. So another 10 seconds. Oh, Open right. arms. That makes me think of that song. Open arms. <laughs> Who sings that? Okay. What's my role? Uncancelability. Thank you. Yes to uncancelability. This isn't just a fun project. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. I really want to honor and appreciate and respect how you're engaging with us. And um, so I'm going to set my timer for three minutes, 30 seconds. So when it goes off, I'll have 30 seconds left. Um, there we go. OK. So. When I was preparing, I was in the building next door writing these out, and I heard a speaker over this, the um, PA system who was doing something in the theater there saying, 30% of the world's trees are facing extinction. How many of you knew that? Okay. Last week, the data was released. 45% of known flowering plants are facing extinction. How many of you knew that? How many of you heard within the last two weeks that billions of snow crabs in a certain sea perished? because of warming seas, and they, they, they starve to death. How many of you have heard of that? Billions of our relatives. Okay, We're in the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, depending on which ones you count, mass extinction event. It takes the biosphere millions of years to reconstitute to support certain complex forms of life. We have until 2025 to cap peak emissions to 1.5 degrees. And that's optimistic for all the carbon we need to sequester. Okay, how many of you heard the AMOC, AMOC, ocean current? Okay, all right. So climate scientists have been saying for years, current trajectory, that ocean current will collapse. And one of the impacts will be that will turn the climate of Europe into the climate of Alaska, but it won't happen in our lifetime. Two months ago, retake. It'll happen between 2025 and 2095, 90 to 95% sure. This is not right relationship, okay? It's many or some modern humans 
extracting, exploiting, destroying, subjugating. Whereas many, and I don't want to romanticize because to romanticize indigenous peoples is to dehumanize us, but many, perhaps most indigenous peoples, have for since time immemorial lived with an understanding of being part of a larger system and relationships of respect and reciprocity. And so we want indigeneity to meet Web 3.0, not in terms of, you know, Bitcoins and all that, but a decentralized component. So part of this is um, USDN is an organization that serves its 1,700 sustainability directors in urban municipalities in Canada and the U.S., serving 100, oops, the wrong one, sorry, serving, here we go, 100 million residents, 100 million people, all right? We have access to hundreds of indigenous leaders who have deep interest and knowledge about moving beyond performative land acknowledgement statements. Oh, I honor the Ohlone people, goodbye, let's get on with our meeting. What does it mean to really, really, really know the history and move into establishing or deepening right relationships between original peoples and settlers? Okay. What does it mean to really tap into? Indigenous people are stewards of 80% of the most biodiverse regions in the world. We have tons of traditional ecological knowledge which we've been passing on generation after generation. What if that proliferates with us as leaders at the center? Okay, Land rematriation, when you rematriate the land, 30 seconds, could you hit that please? When you rematriate the land, all kinds of magical things happen. The biodiversity comes back and rights of nature. So these are things that, that USDN is willing to engage with hundreds of indigenous leaders to pull across their 1,700 sustainability directors and municipalities in Canada and the US to proliferate to over 100 million people. And I'll say more about an app that we have that kind of makes that self-organized where people can go to a portal for this, dial up or dial down their feed, okay? Hey, you're doing this, we start to connect. You did that over here, you did a, we suddenly have a group, we go off somewhere and make something happen. There's a little bit of centralization, but a lot of self-organizing. Let me stop there. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, what did what you hear? hear? Okay, show me land taxes, That's yep. Right. 2025, self-organizing. Beyond urgency. Our planet is dying. Mm. We're in trouble. If I can, I would say it's transforming. We just might not be here, but the planet is going to be all right. Yeah. That's yeah. real. Urgency. Okay. Ten more seconds. You have land of voice. Yeah. Rights of nature, yes. Oh, oh, oh shit. All right, let's go to the next question. Jeez. What excited you? about what I shared. USDN, a plan, possibility, network solutions, indigeneity. 100 million people. Yeah. There's work to be done, collective action, beyond land acknowledgement. The role that we could play, I like that one. Possibility, indigenous leadership. And 10 more seconds. Commitment to action. Your solution app. Okay, let's go to the next one. What questions or concerns do you have for me or about anything that I shared? Mm. Timelines too. Timelines, roadblocks. Is it up enough? Mm -hmm. Visibility of work. Mm. Who's listening? Is there enough time? Elections. 
Pragmatic small pragmatic actions, yeah. Pragmatic. Who's listening? Yeah. Do How can you help? Uh, Disparity? No, it's not male-led. Momentum. Five more seconds. Not and sure to the final was. one. There it goes. What do you need to engage with me, to dive in, as a collaborator, as a funder, as an investor, or in any other role that calls to you? Ready to dive in. All right. Model the children, absolutely. More info. What can people do? Model to share. More indigenous women. Yep. Yep. More indigenous women, yes. Clear ask. Yes. Mm -hmm. Connection. Donation. Where More seconds. Do you need help? What can people do? More info. Okay, so let's stop there. And again, thank you for that gives me a lot. Thank you for relating. Thank you for relating with us with me in this way. Um, and so let's just pause. Notice what arises for you. What are you feeling in your body? What are your thoughts? Your emotions? What's the quality of your relationship to us? To each other? to this place. So we're going to quickly go through, each of us, a call to action and engage you. So we're at 524. We have till 545 for the panel. And then we have another 10 minutes. And we have to be out of here by 5 of 6 to honor. Um, the workers who are helping us so much, Anthony, who's our projectionist, and others. So um, that's just, we need to, you know, yep. go with our calls to action. So, Jamie. Ooh, support Indigenous women to write blank checks, or no, to have blank checks. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 wait, we, we get to like two minutes. This oh, is our final, this is not, oh, final, this wow. is our final closing okay. aspiration. Yeah. Okay. Um, I definitely want to see more indigenous women in positions of leadership and power, not only in finance and philanthropy, in decision making, in government and policy. We got to witness Deb Holland arise to her, you know, to where she's at now in New Mexico as we were building the Oregon. That was such a beautiful time to witness, but that's it. That's the, there's like one indigenous woman in Congress right now. Yeah, Therese. So, yeah, I want to see more of that. Um, I think also what we've learned in a lot of the trauma work and the financial trauma work of not only how like scarcity affects people, but what happens when an organization gets $10 million, you know, that is also something that, um, that we also have to like recognize and contend with and, um, ensuring that there are safe spaces for indigenous women to work. So looking at pay equity, um, ensuring that when lateral violence comes up, when um, work culture rooted in white supremacy comes up that causes burnout, and to be able to like organize and support one another when that happens. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in my fellowship around burnout and like the impacts on mental health, impacts on people's um, physical health is quite real, and women of color often carry the, not only the emotional burden of this work, but it affects our bodies and our, and our children in many ways. So I would say protect indigenous women, protect women, protect black and brown women. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and support indigenous led organizations. I think there's a lot around here in this area. And um, I've witnessed a lot of my partners and folks in the community that are also fundraising in this space. And we have to fund urgently and abundantly. Um, I've been a grant writer and a fundraiser forever, and you know, initially, thousand dollars was a big deal, <laughs> but 
it's if you're sustaining organizations, and this is what I heard just at the other panel just yes just earlier, is you cannot nonprofitize I nonprofitize a movement. It takes more than that. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kali. So much to say and so much to ask. <laughs> Um, again, I want to thank all of you for participating. Um, but concretely, for us, um, the, one of the core things that unites us is our, our program around acquiring and decommodifying land. Uh, and in the situation that we all exist in, where reparations are a notion but not yet a reality, that means in order to decommodify it, we actually have to purchase it. So for us, uh, where all of us are at, we're roughly you know, trying to raise, within the next two years, about $4 million each at each of those locations to either acquire uh, some, because different places, different of our communities in different places, to either acquire or make improvements upon, capital improvements on structures that we already have, right? Um, and that will, will be a critical breakthrough for all of those particular uh, communities uh, in a major way. And then what it also, uh, a part that we didn't get to talk about is the complex nature of, uh, for us, uh, politicizing the complex nature of non-indigenous people owning land and in a way that is not exploitative. So, you know, how are we improving, uh, in our case, how are we directly uh, having relationship with the Choctaw? Uh, in the case of Cooperation Vermont, it's the Abenaki. In the case of uh, um, Atlanta, uh, it's the Muscogee, or the Creek. Uh, in the case of uh, Idlewild, uh, in particular, uh, I believe it's the, it's, it's the Ojibwa, but I could be wrong on that. I have to double check that. Hmm? Um, and so all of us are, are in dialogue about how do we be stewards, but how do we also return the land relative to claims against the United States government. So it's a piece that we just, I wanted to interject that because I think it's a deeper conversation we have to have about what it actually means to decolonize, you know, um, but what it also means for, for black people to try to be here as in diaspora and, but not try to be settlers. So our request is based upon trying to deepen that particular set of practices, just to make that clear. Thank you, Kelly. Vanessa. <clears throat> um, first of all, you can see why this right relationship took time. Can you imagine, like, when we all came together and how big our work is and how diverse our work is, and they expected us to just come it under <laughs> some <laughs> thing? Um, so I just want to say, like, to me, part of what I want to walk away with is that, you know, we quickly had to find a relationship together to be able to have a panel that had continuity, clarity, <laughs> and a way to actually consider what it looks like in these transactional spaces like SOCAP and the investment places. What does it mean to have a moment in time where we can have some kind of connection, but you also get enough information about us too so we can move our work forward, right? Like, we all need resources. We also need networks. We need partnerships. Um, but the other is we don't want any just networks, money, and partnerships. We want right relationships. I want to work with someone who's like, Vanessa, I see the vision of rematriating economies. Because it's not just venture capital we're trying to get into. This is a start. We had to go all the way to the most harmful kinds of capital to see if we could do this. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Mary, for trusting. But the reality is I want to see rematriating economies apprenticeship in real estate, mm -hmm. asset management, family offices. I want us to see us running SoftBank, BlackRock. Because once you see us in the driver's seat of capital, the percentage I think a lot about is the Earth's remaining biodiversity steward by indigenous people. There's a sadness and a, a light there all at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
I posit, what does it look like if indigenous people, particularly indigenous women, were managing 80% of the Earth's capital? How different would it look like for our families, our communities, and the land? Because we all know what we can do with a couple of nickels. Imagine what we could do with billions and trillions. So for me, this is an opportunity for us to look at a panel like this, see how quickly we had to come together and through trials and tribulations. But the trust that's now here, we hope that you understand this is what we're offering and the kind of right relationship and investing we're looking for. Thank you, Vanessa. And I'm going to give myself a buzzer again. <laughs> I like the self-moderating piece of this. 15 seconds. Um, let me say, One Thriving Planet and A Planet are the two organizations I'm representing. If you go to One Thriving Planet's website, what we do, we have a link to Bioneers, which is the indigenous form is like one of my favorite places to be every year. Uh, a, a plug for um, Alexis Bunton and Cara Romero. So um, we have a link to work they did where in Aotearoa, the Maori term for New Zealand, there was a movement over several years, rights of nature, to return personhood to a sacred mountain and her surrounding ecosystems. They were successful. She is her own person. And non-Maori law has to bend to Maori law to learn how for thousands of years human beings have stewarded in right relationship the ecosystems. So we're aiming for those kinds of impacts. Okay, and One Thriving Planet, um, so we started this work with USDN, we're looking just for last week in Zimbabwe, um, we want to make links with Outer Terra, New Zealand, we want to go to all continents except Antarctica, um, but we're going to fund this work because it's about really powerful outcomes, but we're part of a constellation that says we need so much. Expedition Future, we're working with Swiss Parliament, a group that's working with the Swiss Parliament. They've come up with a two-day process to get people across the ideological spectrum, parliamentarians, to consensus, and then go back into Parliament and advance legislation. They've come up with Climate Positive Transportation Center, Climate Positive Financial se Sector, um, and other things. Future Africa, we just started in Zimbabwe with ministers from the newly uh, re-elected president. If you could hit that for me, 15 seconds. Um, we work with high-performing leaders and teams, Autodesk, a billion-dollar sustainability bond, high-tech firm, multi-million-dollar sustainability foundation, um, San Francisco Environment Department responsible for climate protection in San Francisco city and county, impactful leadership networks, and this, again, indigenization projects. So we are getting outcomes. We are getting results. The planet can't wait. Our relatives and all species cannot wait. Support this work. So we're going to open it up to discussion, dialogue, Q&A. What? Yeah? OK, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you, I, I thought, did you have your hand up? I, I thought it was for, that's why I hesitated. You put it down. One, two, yeah. Thank you. Vanessa, um, I will just make a comment that um, we're at this space of social impact and social capital to make social change and impact. Um, when you invest in indigenous businesses, you're already doing that. It doesn't matter. They don't have, like, that's what we have in our core values of the companies that we start, the reason why we build things larger than us and invest in more than ourselves. We see it affecting our communities and the people that we love and what we love um, to preserve. Um, so if you invest in indigenous companies, you're already investing in a social impact. So only comment I wanna make. Thank you. Thank you. I came last year for the first time and I tracked all the indigenous presentations as best I could. And I met more indigenous people in those few days than I have my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so refreshing to have conversations. What I would suggest that you propose is you go to the program organizer and you have a full tr one track clearly outlined that's focusing on the interests of indigenous, marginalized, whatever category you want to call it, 
So I don't have to search through the thing because that's what I'm most interested. We have to learn from the most marginalized communities, the most disadvantaged ones, if we're going to have any hope of dealing with inequities because they're the ones who face the brunt of it. Thank you. I don't know if that's our job. <laughs> I think you should advocate for that. And then I think... Um, I think SOCAP should, one, let us all do our presentations instead of slamming us into one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and then two, uh, ensure these are the big stages. Yes. Ani, Buju, Vanessa, Melody, Serna. One, I, I just want to tell you, a thousand chimigwaches because I've been following you for a really long time and you're super inspirational to Native women um, across Indian country, including myself. Um, I do a lot of business and tribal consulting and I come to SOCAP as a grassroots kind of consultant. Um, and really my, my focus is creating those networks of accessibility. Um, so why are funders not funding Native women and indigenous uh, businesses? But also, I think we're looking for that space um, and accountability. And I think, you know, we were just having this conversation in, in a DEI workshop where I asked a question and an entire panel glossed over the question when it came to indigeneity. They didn't even answer it. And so when I went back, um, they were... They were like, oh, but we're doing indigenous work. So I, I'm looking for, in, in I, I guess, for the funders in the room and the allocators of the funding, um, at what point do we hold you accountable to staying at 2% of philanthropic and investment funds? Like where do we as indigenous women finally start calling out investors like Kellogg and SOCAP and Sorensen and, and so on and so forth, right? And I'm not picking on any one individual, but there's several of billions of dollars that are here um, in this conference. Why are you staying at 2%? And, and why is it our responsibility to continue to beg for the pennies that you're giving away to the same silos that our work fits into because we're indigenous? Like, why do you need an indigenous silo when we're standing right here? And so I'm just, I wanted your opinion on kind of silos and why do we have to be put there? And then how do we uplift folks like myself who are doing that grassroots consulting work? And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford to come here, but there are thousands of Native women across Indian country that do this work too. And how do we all collectively come together and, and kind of collaborate with you all as well, as well as the funders? I know that was a lot, I'm sorry. It was excellent, thank you. What's the start? So we try to model accessibility. We just had a summit here at NASDAQ like three weeks ago. It was free for indigenous women. We paid for their travel, their hotel. That's right. And we're modeling that. And we also talk about making sure that speakers have generous honorariums, especially if they're experiencing pay inequities. Um, but that's one thing that we've tried to do. And uh, I, yeah, I am in full agreement. Like I was like, why do I got to pay for a SOCAP? You know, like, whose land are you on? <laughs> but I don't know, V, do you want to add more to that? You know, I, th I think, uh, I don't know. I have a couple things to, to say. Uh, I think one is um, SOCAP is just one institution. Um, I think we're building our own institutions for a reason, right? We don't need to keep putting ourselves in harmful spaces. However, when we still have to be in these places, I think the push is hard. And like, if you've been at this fundraising game long enough, you've seen the cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we see the shift in, this, in the, where the funding is going and how the funds are being structured, how do we get into the other side of the house, which isn't the grant making side, but where the real money is sitting is complicated. Um, it really, for us and for my sort of work on this is like, I keep thinking, like, I want to go to your institution. I want to come hang out with you where you're building and meet your funder network. And then I want you to come to our institutions and, and like, go and meet our community and network. And the reason for it is because this is a lifetime's work of relationship building. Yeah. To get a funder to get on the same page with you that actually feels generative and meaningful takes time. And then if you just want that transactional and there's an opportunity for that, 
I just really encourage us to come from a place of these are my minimum requirements, my manifesto and how I'm going to accept your money. Because as my friend Brett and I were talking, how much, how much time has been wasted in conversations with funders that at the end of it, they're like, you know, this might be a strategy we're looking at next year. We're in the middle of a new conversation. Know your worth, know your time. Know what it is you need, get in, get out. But if you're building those long-term generational relationships, that's the opportunity to start to push them to consider spend down, to start to open the gates between both sides of the house, the grant making and the investment side. But it's, it's relationships, and these are not transferable. So however you define it, build it. But if you're getting that money that's not going to be the most relationship and partnership based, know how you need it and don't negotiate it. Thank you, Vanessa. Yes. Love it. I would add just one thing. Um, beautifully, beautifully spoken. Um, what if indigenous people control 80% of the capital, and particularly indigenous women? What if the people who have, since time immemorial, successfully stewarded the biodiversity of the lands of the earth were at the center of the leadership and decision making. So if SOCAP is talking about impact, we already have the data points. Put money behind the impact. Thank you. Um, Gina Jackson, uh, co-CEO of Return to the Heart Foundation, a foundation that was created three years ago by Native women, for Native women and girls. Um, a couple things. One of the things that I've been hearing for so long is that we as Native people are vulnerable. And there's nothing about us that makes us vulnerable. We were targeted. And that language needs to change. We were targeted for our land and resources. We were then pointed at and looked and blamed for being poor. And so um, I think for everybody in the room, please, don't use that language. Use the language targeted. Because there's, a, in the US, and I don't blame anyone, you know, that w grew up in the US education system, but history was not taught to you about indigenous people. We don't talk about the genocide that has taken place on the US soils. You know, the new movie that just came out, Killers of the Flower Moon, is one, one example. There's thousands and thousands of examples, and we don't know about them. General population doesn't know. And in order to reckon with the truth that happened, and it's coming because, you know, Deb Holland is doing the road to healing, and the stories are going to come out. The bodies of babies and children are going to be found and documented. That's coming. But as investors, as, in, as funders, if you, it comes down to values, really. If you believe in equity, if you believe in justice, then do a self-assessment and check your portfolio. In the last census, we are pushing 3%. Is 3% going to indigenous people of your portfolio? Just, just check it, because if you believe in equity and justice, then, then walk it. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. Thank you. Did anyone want to reply to? Out of respect, I think, for um, the workers and worker solidarity, uh, we got our one minute card. Um, so I just want to be mindful of that. Actually, we, um, so that's one minute till the close, then we have okay. 10 more minutes. Um, and we have to be out by 5 of 6 so that the room is completely cleared by 6 o'clock. So we have 10 more minutes. Thank you. Thank you for noting that. Thank you, Colin. So did anyone have any responses to um, the comments? Or Support 100%. Mm -hmm. okay. um, following what you were saying, I, I have a comment. I, too, were taught the myths about my country's uh, story and I think on these lands on these grounds they're hauntings mm. so in our country every summer there are these movies we make them all the time where aliens with 
advanced technology enter our airspace. <laughs> they want one of three things. One, the planet for its resources. Yeah. Two, humans as possible slave labor. Or three, the human species as a means uh, to propagate their species. Even though there are myths that were constructed and propagated within the psyche of the soul of the country, there's something which is known and we're telling on ourselves through our art and our cinema. Yeah. The stories we tell every single summer are the very stories of the founding of the country. And I think that I, I had the privilege of being part of an organization where we did the work of developing and building a lynching memorial in my community. I had the privilege of chairing the organization. I'm certain that there were people who invested in this, white folks who invested in this, because they were trying to pay for freedom. They know that they're being haunted by something. There's things that you can't outrun when it's within you. And I would simply say I'm deeply grateful for the examples and the sacrifices that all of y'all have made. I feel more hopeful, even though I'm exhausted. <laughs> and, and with that being said, um, I want my country to be free. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at folks, my white friends, and just because they don't necessarily recognize their bondage, I still do. Yeah. And I'd like our land to be whole. Ashe. Aho. Thank you. Any comments or replies? I'm, you know, I'm struck by what all needs to be said, and it's not enough time, right? Mm -hmm. um, to be, to be honest, um, I will say this about, um, I think this uh, process is that. There's been a tremendous amount of work, particularly I think the last 15 years, for all of us to be able to have more authentic conversations you know, with the different forces of capital. And it has moved, I'm not gonna say it's not. Uh, but there's, there is a, a push to make it go further. Because um, ultimately I want to live in a world, and this is just me, I want to live in a world where capital is actually not necessary, right? Uh, because right relationship has actually been restored, yeah. 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 right? Um, and so there's a process of extracting from it what is extracted from us to be able to reshape, you know, our uh, relationships. And the the piece that that I'm sitting here with, honestly, uh, is about the urgency. And I was a little scared, y'all, when uh, Lawrence was going over some of those uh, figures. And so few people knew uh, that. Like, that is a concern. I'm not going to lie. I will add to that one of the things that was just pointed out, uh, you know, because I, I monitor a lot of that information, just being a science nerd, uh, but also being involved um, in the, the the cap, um, I mean, excuse me, the climate, the climate process, the negotiations, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also I always read all, all of the ICCP reports for the, before they come on every year, and the last five or six years they've actually been pretty great, but also amazingly scary. And one of the things that struck me about the recent report, now they they are trying to do some verification of this, but it builds on one of the things, not only about a certain amount of uh, trees going extinct but that roughly we're about 6.5 billion trees short of what we need, and that there are a good number of trees already which are now carbon emitters, not carbon transformers, because of the stress and strain that they are already under. So the aggregate effects are tremendous, but we are still funding the transformation in drips. Yep. That's right. Right. And th there needs to be more of a flood, not a flood that's going to create more chaos and confusion in our communities, because we know that does happen. Right. Uh, you inject money without certain kind of process. You actually create more harm than you do good. Uh, but in recognizing where there are ser serious solutions already at play and things being put in motion to advance and accelerate things, those things need to be funded and boosted far more than what they are. Mm -hmm. So all of you go back and have conversations with folks that you're in, you know, in process with. Like if we're serious about 
meeting the times and meeting the challenge, how we engage in this process of investing has to transform to meet that. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. yeah. So I know we have two people really quickly, one, then two, and then we're going to close. I'm really quick. So I just want to challenge all of my brothers and sisters from the African diaspora. Um, we are so deeply embedded in this colonized system of extraction. And I've talked with Jamie and Vanessa about this, that I, I really need therapy. Because every time I get into a space and I talk about any sort of reparative funding mechanism that actually rebuilds my people without me or my organization benefiting, the benefit is that people are housed, people are clean, people are whole, children are fed, elders are taken care of, people are healing because they have what they need. My own people look at me like I'm crazy. We got a lot of work to do. And I say this because the system was created specifically on stolen land, stolen labor, and stolen people. Mm -hmm. Black people, whether you want to, I understand we're from Africa. We're also connected to these women. Because on our backs of oppression, trauma, we have to be able to be in space with one another. And not just be in space, but build relationship and love each other. And the system counts on us dividing and conquering and having ideologies rooted in anti-blackness and having ideologies rooted in anti-indigeneity. And that shit has to stop. Yes. It has to stop. So I'm challenging us because the only way I feel like I'm sane is when I'm on Zoom with them two. <laughs> when I'm talking about this, these types of structures. And when I saw their IP sheet for Native Women Lead, I was like, I am not crazy. Thank you. Because I knew, everybody was telling me I was crazy, out of, you know, are you accusing me of all sorts of terrible behavior. And I'm like, I'm just trying to heal. We have nothing. We've got all of these fucking education. We own nothing anymore in my community. We had more doing Jim Crow and Reconstruction than we do right now. And it's because we don't own not one thing. And even if we did, I'm going to say this. Most of us don't need to own nothing because all we're trying to do is replace white men and how we rule, govern, and take care of everything. That shows we should not be stewarding anything. Almost. So we need healing. We need to challenge each other. We need to decolonize ourselves and be in spaces and figure out how we can be in collaboration and rebuild ourselves to be holistic and healed as a African people so we have choices. So we can actually live and breathe and be in community with one another and to be in loving relationships with our First Nations brothers and sisters, with our indigenous brothers and sisters across the global world that's the only way we're going to see through because the powers that be don't want that to happen. 